Welcome to Founderline. I'm your host, Joe Beninato, and it's great to have you all with us today. Uh, this is our first show of Founderline, and I'd like to take a moment just to tell you why we're doing this show. I've been involved in startups here in Silicon Valley for 25 years, and I love being involved in startups. I, um, I know how hard they are. I've been uh, CEO of multiple companies. I've been on the exec teams of even more, and uh, there's some great days. There's some really tough days. And uh, as we were starting to think about this show, uh, what, what came up was a forum for founders and startup people to go ask questions and get their questions answered by people who have been either entrepreneurs or investors in those companies. So maybe you're thinking about starting a company, maybe you're working at a company currently thinking about, hey, what are my stock options worth? What's going on? Is this company going in the right direction? Should I take this job offer at a hot new startup? Whatever, whatever it might be, we're, uh, we're going to try and answer those questions uh, in the hour that we have today. So if you have a question, we'd love to try and help you. You can reach us a bunch of different ways. Um, first and foremost, this is going to be an interactive show. So we have an 800 number. It's toll free. You can call uh, 1-844-4-FOUNDER, and yes, there's an extra digit in there. Don't forget the extra four. Um, you can email us at help at founderline.com, or you can tweet uh, to us as well. The Twitter handle is at founderline, F-O-U-N-D-E-R-L-I-N-E. And uh, you, if you want to submit something anonymously, you don't want to have your name attached to it, you can go to our website, and there's an Ask a Question tab. You can... Uh, enter something in there and just hit submit and we'll get those via email as well without any um, attribution uh, you know with with your name attached to it so this is going to be a little bit of an experiment um, we're doing this show live and when I told people we we're gonna do this show live everyone thought we were crazy because uh, you know just the challenges of the technology to get the phone calls and answer the messages um, but we figured that's the best way to do this is have it be interactive and uh, have people out there who are watching it live, maybe uh, hanging out at a company together, um, you know, watching it right before happy hour or maybe happy hour is starting right now. Who knows? Um, but we just thought that would be the best way to interact with uh, with people who are interested in this topic. And uh, we're going to we're going to do our best. Uh, we're going to screw up for sure. Uh, hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. And um uh, you know, we'll just see where it goes. So with that, uh, let's get the first episode started. Um, I want to introduce our first guest uh, in the inaugural show. This is Sar Gur from CRV. He's a general partner there. And uh, Sar and I have known each other a number of years. Um, he's been both on the entrepreneur side as well as uh, an investor. Companies like Twitter, Brightroll, Dropbox, uh, and DoorDash. So he knows what it's like to be in your shoes. If you're founder of a company or an executive or you know, just working at a startup, he knows, uh, he knows what it's like. So Sar, welcome and thank you for being our first guest. Really honored, thanks, thanks for having me. It's, it's, uh, it's so great to have him here. And um, what we're gonna do is, um, before we dive into some questions, um, I always think it's helpful to know, uh, you know a little bit about the people. So um, it'd be great if you can talk Maybe maybe start with um, some of your adventures sure. back when you were working as an entrepreneur or um, or at some startup companies. Maybe share a couple of anecdotes or stories from that, uh, you know, to to help people know a little bit more about you. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks again for having me. Uh, you know, my background um, before I got into venture is and and as you know, uh, since you're a, a close friend. Um, even today, I continue to hack at a lot of businesses, uh, and, and many right. of my investments have been very, you know, I've been involved at, at the earliest stages of helping things get started. Uh, but right before I joined CRV, uh, I was working with one of my best friends, uh, Todd Setradotti, to help start a video ad network called Brightroll uh, that's gone on to do very well. Uh, before that, I was at a startup called Adteractive that some friends of mine uh, had originally started on a credit card, and I joined them, uh, and we built that business to about 160 million dollars uh, with no outside capital. Wow! Uh, Just bootstrapped it from bootstrapped wow. from, from yeah from a credit card, uh, and and famously, uh, you know, along the way had opportunities to 
potentially sell the business for uh, lots of money and 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 uh, unfortunately made a number of bad decisions <laughs> along the way that, that led to that company not being worth anything. Uh, oh wow, um, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I've started helped start a number of companies, many project things that started as projects that did not work out at all and sort of cratered and and died. Uh, and um, before I joined Adteractive, I it was in the heart of the dot com bust. I wrote a business plan with another one of my good friends, um, and we actually worked on a big real estate project where we raised uh, about $10 million and bought 22 properties, uh, created a land assemblage, and hired a bunch of people uh, wow. to do that. Um, I didn't know you were a real estate mogul also. That's, uh, that's yeah, good to we know. Were, we were lucky with that one. We, we sold that one uh, and, and did quite well. But um, And then, as you know, my wife and I own a small chain of uh, little yogurt cafes here in the Bay Area. Yeah, fresh yogurt um, for those of you who don't know. Right. Uh, place to go in uh, Palo Alto and what, is it one in San City? Francisco and, and yeah, Stanford, Stanford and well. San Francisco. So awesome. Yeah, she'll be happy you gave her. That's right. Uh, gave, gave her, her a plug, plug today. <laughs> awesome. Well, so then, so you're you're you know involved in a bunch of these companies, and then how did how did the transition to VC go? I think I think you're doing some angel investing along the way, and then eventually yeah. joined CRV. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's it's funny in um, in this environment to try and remember what the dot com bust was like, and especially if you're a younger entrepreneur, you, you may not even know. But yeah, at that time, uh, you know, I, I was I was helping run businesses uh, and was busy operating, and there were a number of entrepreneurs who were starting companies in the dot com bust where investors really were not interested in. The internet, if you know, if you can imagine, the internet was really exciting in the dot com days. Lots of venture capitalists and angel investors sort of piled money in, yeah. and then in the dot com bust, a, a lot of VCs lost their jobs. Uh, many of them were focused on fixing their portfolios. Uh, many folks who were quick to make angel investments in the dot com days pulled way back and realized that the good times were over, and they may not see those you know big sales again. Uh, and while I was operating. Again, I, I ended up working with some entrepreneurs at very early stages where I, I wasn't trying to be an investor. I actually, just being very passion oriented and, and loving helping founders, yeah. got involved in some companies uh, at very early stages where I ended up making some investments um, really to help them more than, the, than trying to be a rational sort of investor. Um, and, and in doing so, I just got, you know, got lucky that some of those companies ended up uh, you know, becoming meaningful businesses at the time here in the Valley. And, and I got involved in helping a number of them raise venture capital, uh, helping a number of them get sold. Uh, and, and somewhere as the dot-com bust sort of, I guess, hit the bottom and started to come back, a number of venture capitalists uh, tried, you know, tried to convince me to do venture and thought I might actually be good at it. Um, and a number of my entrepreneurial friends who had come to me for advice uh, over the years also were encouraging me, thinking I might, I might be very good at it. And so... Uh, after about two years of uh, not wanting to do venture and, and thinking I would continue to operate and sort of getting this feedback and uh, and then thinking I might really enjoy it, I ended up uh, meeting the folks at Charles River Ventures and joining them. And uh, yeah, it's been a ride and, ever since. And uh, still, still headquartered in Boston, or have you guys? You still have two offices, right? Or uh, how's how's the split now? I know it started obviously out yeah. in Boston. Yeah. So, so CRV started uh, now over 40 years ago outside of uh, outside of Boston, uh, in Boston, um, uh, and. Uh, and over time, we've sort of migrated a lot of the partnership west. So yeah. today, there are actually more folks on the west coast than the east coast. Um, we have, I'd call it, two and a half uh, partners who are based in Boston, and, and the rest of us, uh, call it six and a half folks, uh, are based on the west coast. And, and the half is one of my partners who basically spends half his time between the two coasts. Got it. Yeah. Great. Well, um, it's... it's uh I think it's always helpful to just sort of understand and and you know I I always tell entrepreneurs that um, I'm helping out with their companies like the best investors are the people who have actually been in your chair before so um, uh, you know they know about the ups and downs they don't freak out when weird things happen because they've been through their share of of those as well so. Uh, uh, so you know great background if, if any of you have uh, you know 
businesses that you want to talk to Sar about, uh, you can tweet at him. His Twitter handle is at Sar Sar S A A R S A A R, and uh, you know he'll uh, he'll be sure to take a look at those. I'm sure. Um, so let's try this grand experiment. We've got awesome. we've got actually a couple of callers on hold, and uh, we'll see if this actually works well. But um, I am gonna turn on the microphone, and we have uh, we have Aaron on the line from uh, the 303 area code. Aaron, uh, do you have a question for us, us today? Yeah, Joe. Thanks for taking me my call. Um, I have a question. I think both of you guys are very well qualified to answer. Um, it's an age-old question that entrepreneurs want to know before they build something. How do you validate an idea? How do you validate an idea? Thanks, thanks, yeah, Aaron. It's a great question. So, it's for you. Sure, take it. Yeah, it, it's a great question, and you know, I, I would actually say that one of the real talents that we see from entrepreneurs who have started a number of businesses. Uh, and have built a number of companies is they really develop a talent uh, both in having great judgment into how to test an idea quickly and really test the core of an idea uh, simply and, and easily. A, a first time mistake we see for a lot of entrepreneurs is they sort of overbuild uh, their first prototype and there's really a skill in now what many people call an MVP uh, that's really supposed to test that core value proposition um, test market demand, test the value proposition to the user, whatever it may be. Um, and it's, it's hard, to, it's very hard to do, um, but generally we find that through practice, often what we find is people will overbuild and, and they really, um, it takes a skill to sort of be creative and reduce, 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 reduce all of the features down to the core of what their idea, uh, really what you're trying to test in that initial prototype. Um, Hopefully that's that's the beginning of an answer. No, for that's, you. that's great. Um, so we've got we've got some emails coming in, and bear bear with me while we're sort of filtering through these. Um, my my producer Joel is uh, is sending me some of this stuff, but uh, um, you know we're we're gonna have to fight our way through figuring out. Uh, so I think I think next one we're gonna have is a call, another call. This one is um, from Hong. Let's see if uh, we've got Hong. Are you on the line? Hey, Joe. How's it going? Good. How, how are you? Yeah. We'd love to hear your question. Great. Um, so uh, I think you spoke about earlier, you know, a lot of these startups, you start working on things that you're passionate about. Um, and But I see this seems to be a kind of uh, diametrically opposed to what VCs are looking for, which are these large, very, very large exits these days. Like anything under a billion dollars doesn't seem to be making news. Um, how do you know? Like, I, I feel like things I work on that I'm interested in are all seem like good ideas, but they all look very, very small at this stage. How do you know that you're onto something that could potentially be a huge, huge billion dollar business? That's, great, great question. Yeah, Hong, it's, it's a great question. You know, I, I think um, th I, there's a number of ways to answer the question, but I guess, you know, first is, is just in terms of market size and, and market potential is one way to cut it. So you know, depending on if you look at the fundamental value proposition of the product and, and who that addresses, you know, you can start to figure out, you know, is that a, is that a large market or, or not a large market? So if you're serving, as an example, if you're serving, you know, males between the ages of 60 and 61 in the Mountain View zip code, uh, you know, who like wearing blue shirts, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're sort of limiting yourself in terms of, you know, how big of a market you can build and, and whether you'll be able to build a, a huge business. If you now say we're going to serve, you know, all Americans or everyone in the world, uh, then, you know, you start to have a huge addressable market. And if your product really resonates and really is 10x better than, than other things in market and, and can really reach those folks, you know, you can start to paint a path where a company can get very big, even if initially it looks very small. Um, there's there's lots of examples, and often investors make big mistakes in making the wrong call as to whether a technology can go broad or is it narrow. A classic example uh, with the recent press around a company like Uber is many folks early on thought Uber was just going to be in the town car market, and then there were debates on whether the, the black town car market was a big enough market or not. 
other folks that said, well, Uber could become the Expedia or Hotwire of ground transportation. Hmm. They could become the booking engine, saw a much bigger vision and a bigger path. And you often don't know as an entrepreneur when you're starting, but if you can paint a line, even if it's not a solid line, but a sort of dotted line to how things could get more interesting over time, you know, that, that's often a good indicator that you may be onto a bigger idea. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Song. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got a bunch of emails coming in. Um, this, one, uh, this one's actually pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, this is from someone named Douglas in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, uh, the question is, how do I get an investor for my ceramic ware manufacturing project from the USA? So, uh, and there was, there was more to the email, but we, we filtered it down to that. Basically, um, apparently they, they build ceramics there in large numbers. And uh, uh, he's, he's actually talked to a number of investors over there and is now starting to look for investors over here in America. So, you know, probably not your uh, typical yeah. uh, technology VC investment, but uh, maybe you can give him some tips about uh, some things you might be able to look at. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's not a question I think about it every day, but I would say, <laughs> you know, I, there's different types of folks that might be interested in investing in, in Africa. Uh, you know, starting with folks like myself who are sort of professional investors, they'd really need a compelling story for why there would be a great return and a better return than other investment opportunities that they may have in front of them. So without knowing more about this specific ceramic opportunity, you know, it, it's hard to say whether this would get anyone's attention here relative to other opportunities they may have. Because there's also additional complexities to the average investor in investing in Africa, whether it's, is it legal to invest in Africa? Do I, do, where do I send my money and do I trust the banking system? As well as, you know, one of the key issues in, in any investment uh, that's related to early stage investing is that you're investing in the team. And the fact that people don't know you and don't have a relationship with you can make it quite challenging for someone to actually bring out their checkbook and want to invest in a company that's so far away with uh, you know, people that they don't know. So I guess if I were in your shoes, I would say I would probably look towards people networks or proxies of folks that do know you well and, and have a point of view on the business you know, that can be either they trust you and have capital or they can be proxies of trust for other folks that are stewards of capital, you know, as a way to think about where to spend your time trying to find money. Um, otherwise, I think it's challenging. I think there are another set of investors, folks that have, like, like Kiva and Vitana and other organizations that have helped facilitate flows of funds into places like Africa. And those are probably great people networks to try and get to know and surround yourself with because they've got strong connections into the US capital markets as well. Awesome. Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna switch back to the phone. Uh, we have a call. Let's see from Ryan in San Francisco. It's uh, it's about founder compensation. Let me switch it over here. Ryan, are you, are you with us? Hey, Joe. It's Brian. Oh, Brian. Hey, hey Brian. Brian. How are you? Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my question, just real briefly, is you know, curious. How would you think about? striking the balance between equity and cash when uh, employing, say, your first five to 10 employees? And what do you see as kind of like a, a starting point to think about what's, what is the right balance? Sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I, I guess I would first offer that, um, you know, depending on how the company is capitalized, my general recommendation for folks, uh, often as first-time founders, the mistake we see is that they think that even if they have money in the bank, they should convince those first five employees to take you know, all equity and, and starve themselves on cash. Um, and the challenge we see with that is that, at least in my experience, most startups are really hard. And when, the, when times get tough, if they, don't, if they can't pay rent and they have a whole number of other stresses at home, uh, because they're stressed out, they can't go out to dinner with their friends, they yeah. can't go to their friend's wedding, um, it creates a bunch of retention issues. And so it's actually not healthy to have them you know, live on ramen if the company has capital to pay them a, a meaningful salary. So you know, generally, we um, recommend that you spend time with each employee really understanding to the extent that you can 
you know, where they're at in terms of their lifestyle needs, et cetera. And then you want to make sure that you're giving them cash compensation so that they can give you 100% of their attention and energy without having to stress that they're not going to be able to do the things that they might need to be, they might need to do outside of work. Um, the last thing you want is someone who, you know, took the, took the equity option because that's what, you know, you as the founder sort of sold them on and wanted people that were committed, but then what you're not, you're not getting their full productivity because they're overly worried that they can't, you know, do a number of things, including go to, go to their brother's wedding, you know, buy a gift for something, take a vacation, <laughs> go out to dinner, to, you know, date, um, you know, we've seen all these issues. Um, so, you know, I guess somewhere in there is, is it tends to be pretty personal, the specific ranges that we see. But um, that, that's, I guess, high level guidance I would give relative to mistakes we've seen. And then in terms of, you know, other trade-offs, you know, I think the, we do see many startups who offer some set of options, like, you know, you can pick this package with, in terms of equity and, and base, and then a different option in terms of equity and base. And again, I, you know, I, I, a lot of first-time founders find that they, they really want um, employees to choose the path that offers more equity all the time. And I guess just to maybe having been around uh, for a while, you know, with you and you, you, yeah. as you know, Joe, that the people have, you know, sometimes have constraints at home or, and, and have other reasons that they may be taking a, a package that has higher cash comp that's unrelated to how committed they are to the company. Yeah. And, and I guess I would just be open to that as well as you, you know, try and lay those options out in front of folks. Especially with, um, you know, there are startup people who have kids who, you know, maybe are going to private schools or whatever versus, you know, single employees who can take way more risk because, you know, they, they, they have very low overhead overall. So, uh, yeah, That's definitely, right. definitely seen that. And it's been interesting, you know, as I've, I've been hiring people just to, um, to see, you know, sometimes you, you you take it as well. He's not very committed to our company. He wants two hundred thousand dollars, and he doesn't really care about the stock. But but it's it's just the reality of the situation. Like all things being equal, they'd love to work at a startup, but they've got to be able to pay their bills or whatever it might be. And that that's across the board from you know uh, engineers all the way through to sales and marketing execs. Uh, you know, typically that kind of stuff. Goes I, I, on. Not only would I agree with that, and I think like if you know the employee has kids, you know, you can make assumptions. But one of the mistakes we see is often, you know, you may have someone who's younger who doesn't have kids, and and be frustrated that they've p picked a package that has higher cash comp. And it, there's a specific example I can think of where you know the, a founder was trying to recruit an employee and and what we didn't know is that employee was actually supporting his entire family you know behind the scenes and and so he just needed to pay wow he you know he he had a high burn that was not related to his expenses he yeah. was actually you know living very cheaply but you know without knowing some of those things and 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 you know you could easily reach the wrong conclusion about the person and their commitment to the company makes sense um all right, we, uh, we have another email here. This one's from Larry in Yuba City. Uh, it's about finding the right funding partner. So the question is, um, it's not just about getting money. How would you suggest that an entrepreneur should go about finding the right fit, I think, with an investor? And then uh, part two is, what would Sar suggest from his experience is the right time to seek outside capital? So those are, those are kind of uh, two different questions, but uh, why, don't, why don't you try the first one about fit with the right funding partner. Sure. Yeah, f you know, fit is really important for any entrepreneur with their investor. And, um, you know, the, the, w the model that we tend to think about at CRV is we spend a lot of time with our entrepreneurs early on, uh, you know, just building a high level of trust. Um, I think if there's a high level of trust between the founder and the investor, you can work through all sorts of issues, uh, you know, good and bad through that journey. and. Um, and the second to, to me that's important is accessibility. You know, there's a lot of folks who, um, even if you have trust, but, but if the investor is never accessible when you need them, it, it's hard to get any value out of them and, and really exactly. have a, a real relationship. But, you know, I jokingly think it's similar to, you know, my relationship with my wife, you know, where, you know, I, I both need to trust her, but I also need to see her and spend time just talking to her, yes. you know, to have a, a real meaningful relationship with her. And I think you know, the analogy with investors, I think, is, is somewhat sil similar in that I think you want to build that trust. And, and often you'll see investors when they are negotiating with you, when they're talking to you about your company, 
depending on the words that they use and the actions that they take, to us, many of those are signals of distrust, right, or lack of faith hmm. in the founder. And, and you can pick up on that body language as you're entertaining, talking to different investors. You know, for us, our role is we know the founders are the ones really building, they're responsible for building the companies. We work our asses off to try and help, but it's not our role to stick our hand on the steering wheel and, and tell them what to do. We don't, you know, we don't want to back founders that, that necessarily listen to everything we say. And, and that starts again with a high level of trust in them and their abilities um, as entrepreneurs. And you can sense many investors, I think, start a relationship with an entrepreneur from a very different place. Well, and I, in, in my experience, um, you know, you want to work with people uh, in, in an ideal situation where you've actually developed a bit of a relationship over time. Like, they're not an investor in your company, but you knew them because, you know, you met at a party or um, you've done a couple things together. Uh, and and that, that sort of builds a really good base of trust over time because... Uh, you know, I, I always tell people I don't invest in things that like I'm not personally interested in where I love spending time with the founders or the exec team or whoever it is because life's just too short. And so, um, you know, when, when people are out looking for funding, I always tell them, uh, you know, your investors kind of have to fall in love with you, with, with the idea, with you personally. Uh, you know, just with the market space overall, if, if they're not interested in sports, like they are not funding your sports startup unless you somehow prove to them that this is going to be the next billion dollar opportunity. So, um, so don't even waste your time. Um, and then the second part of, uh, of Larry's question was around uh, the right time to seek outside capital. So what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, there are yeah, a lot of we, variables in that question, obviously. But. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we could, we could spend an hour on that alone just because I, I think it really depends on the type of business that you're building um, and not only when do you see capital, but what sort of capital do you raise if you're working on a real estate project or you're running, you know, you've started a great restaurant or, you know, even in technology, you may be uh, building websites for folks. And, and in many cases, you may want outside capital, you may need outside capital. Um, you may consider debt in some cases, uh, depending on how far along you've gotten in with your business. Um, and then in, you know, the classic sort of venture space, we see some companies that are very capital intensive just to test a, a minimal a minimal viable product. So in that case, we have entrepreneurs all the time who come to us and they need to raise $10 million, you know, before they can even build a prototype. Uh, and in other cases, like in the consumer space, you have great stories like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, who built a product that was growing really fast before he ever raised any, any capital from venture capitalists. So you've got a wide range and I guess it depends depending on the type of business and the type of product that you need to, to put out in the market to, to test the concept. Absolutely. So um, once again, you know, this is an interactive show. We want to hear from you. So uh, you can call us. The number is toll free 844-4-FOUNDER. And don't forget the middle four. Um, our email is help at founderline.com. And we're looking at those uh, emails as they're coming in live. Or you can tweet to at Founderline and we'll, uh, we'll try and answer your questions there. Um, so this is uh, the part of the show where uh, we have to do a few commercials just to pay the bills. So, um, you know, th this show is, uh, is a bit of a labor of love, but it wouldn't be possible without uh, the support we're getting from our two amazing sponsors, Auric and Ustream. You're watching this live now on Ustream, uh, and but first, I'll you know I'd like to talk a little bit about Auric and uh, thank Mitch Zukli. Uh, you know, Mitch and I have known each other for probably ten or twelve years now. Um, uh, we worked together on a previous company, and we've kept in touch over the years. And when I first told him about Founderline, we were just catching up over the phone, and. Um, uh, you know, I said, hey, I'd love to figure out a way to work with you. And, you know, his response was, let's do this. And so I, I just love that there was no hesitation. Um, everyone there has been fantastic getting getting us set up. And uh, I, I know because I've worked with these guys and, uh, and gals, and I know uh, what a great job they've done for me and what a great job they can do for you. So if you're a startup, um, you don't want to think about your lawyer just as the person who's doing your legal paperwork. You want to think of them as sort of your trusted advisor in the same way you would with a VC or anybody else who you're surrounding yourselves with. I've found that 
that like the the most that I get out of the the relationships with my legal team is is more on the advice side just because they've seen so many more transactions than just about anybody else more than more, more than most investors and definitely more than um, most VCs they've seen the ups and the downs they've lived through all sorts of shenanigans uh, and and so you know if, if you're looking for somebody to help you out with your company um, Mitch and Oric are the best so uh, so give them a call um, you can go to oric.com and and check them out um, Mitch is on Twitter at uh, at Mitch Zookley as well um, the the other uh, company I'd like to thank is Ustream so um, uh, Brad is the CEO there and uh, uh, you know we we reached out to Brad originally and said, hey, we're thinking about doing this show. And once again, he said, love the idea. Um, you know, we we definitely want to work with you guys in a, in, on this. And uh, uh, you know, the process has been extremely painless. I, I literally from the from the moment um, we started to set this up, we had a live stream working in about ten minutes, and I'm not making that up, uh, which was which was fantastic. So the whole team over there. Uh, you know, worked with us on getting this set up. Um, the the broadcast quality, we're broadcasting in high def, and I'm sure you can tell. Uh, hopefully, we're not too ugly on screen, but uh, but uh, it's always a danger in high def. But uh, you know, they're they're the best. And so, if you're thinking about doing any uh, you know streaming of of a show or uh, company meetings or whatever it might be. Just go to ustream.tv, that's their website, and you can go uh, find more information. And, and uh, I'm sure the team over there will take uh, just as good a care of you as, as they have, uh, have us. So um, it's time for our, uh, our first installment of a segment we like to call Ask the Lawyer. And um, what we're doing here is we thought it'd be great to have Mitch Zuckley on uh, to sort of walk through, um, uh, you know, a question that might come up on the legal side. So uh, we have Mitch, who's the chairman and CEO of Oric. Mitch, are you uh, are you with us on the phone? Hey, Joe, I'm here, and uh, really psyched to join you and Sar. And thanks for the warm introduction. Awesome! It's great to great to have you, Mitch. Um, so you know, one one of the things we're going to try and do with this segment is. Uh, is cover one legal topic, and so so for those of you who aren't in Silicon Valley, you know this might be a little bit, uh, you know, inside baseball, if you will. But um, since we've got you know such a great uh, group of of people here with us today, I thought we could talk a little bit about a, a topic that's been in the news, which is um, uh, CEOs getting removed from their position at a company, and there was a recent high profile uh, situation that uh, I'm sure many of you have seen. And, and you know, Mitch, I think the question really is, uh, well, there, there are two pieces. One is, you know, what are the circumstances under which, um, you know, a CEO can be removed from their position? And we all hope that that doesn't happen, but uh, we, we've lived through those situations. I've lived through that situation personally. Um, uh, and then secondly, you know, there, there was a bit of a misperception around if the CEO owns more than 50%, well, they can't possibly be removed from their company. And so um, walk, walk us through, you know, how this stuff works. And, um, and then Sarah and I can chime in with some of our uh, experiences as well. You bet. I'd be, thr I'd be thrilled to do it. And I should just say by way of disclaimer that uh, if you're listening today, whatever I'm telling you here is not legal advice. I'm not your lawyer. We don't have an attorney-client <laughs> privilege relationship. But I'm glad <laughs> to answer it in the abstract. And, um, you know, it's actually one of the more thorny legal questions that, and one of the more carefully crafted ones when you actually go to do a venture financing. The general rule is the bylaws determine what happens with respect to the, uh, the, the, governing, the governance of a company. And almost always company bylaws say that the appointment and the removal of any officer, including the CEO, is determined by the majority vote of the board. That, that's almost universal. And so what that means is if you control a majority of the board of directors, you're able to remove someone as CEO of the company. And um, so that's the, the cornerstone sort of piece of information. Now, very often uh, the, the question becomes, well, if you, if you have a majority of the stock, can't you appoint a majority of the board? And it's in that intersection of, okay, 
you have a majority of the stock, but there's a perfectly well-appointed board. How would you remove board members who are existing board members and replace them with your slate where there's a lot of legal wrangling that can happen? And I, and I say can because it happens incredibly rarely. I've been doing this for 18 or 19 years now, and I think there's been three or four instances in my career where we've seen a situation which has been contested where these provisions are really called into play. So it just doesn't happen that often. Um, and, and it's typical that... Um, that where you've got a situation where you've got a venture, uh, venture investors, very often what will happen under something called a voting agreement is there will be an agreement about how the board gets put together. So it will typically say something like two board members are selected by the holders of majority of the common stock, often a majority of the common stock held by the founders. Then maybe two seats go to the, the venture investors and one seat might be an independent. And so um, actually if there was a situation which, which was drafted to say a majority of the common stock uh, was, got a couple seats, a majority of the preferred got a couple seats, and the preferred held a majority of the stock, the preferred guys might be able to convert their preferred stock to common and therefore control the, uh, the, the slate altogether. And so very, very frequently there's a heavily negotiated provision describing whether it's a majority of the preferred held by the common uh, held by like you know the, the founders or, or whether stock can convert and in, in when in terms of measuring the majority of the common stock. So bottom line is it's a pretty complicated area, and um, it's the intersection of voting agreements, bylaws, the certificate of incorporation, and uh, and Delaware law or California law, which are the two most common, which 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 really answer all this question. So it's not at all surprising that it can be challenging to remove a CEO, particularly one who's got a majority of stock. But in no ways is it definitive that someone who's got majority stock will be able to control the board. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is about the most heavily contested sort of, uh, sort of provision. When these, these things are called into question, it's generally not a good situation. And I, and I would say the right. overwhelming majority of the time where you see folks leaving, there isn't a legal wrangle over it. It's a decision made by folks that's probably just time to move on or perhaps even a settlement around uh, how, how they will move on and what, what accelerated vesting might be part of the provision in exchange for a release. Because the situations where you actually find a fight and legal provisions and a potential contested board seat coming up are exceptionally rare and they're generally very damaging to the company to have to go through that. So it's really not in the best interest of of the investors and certainly not in the best interest of, of founders who typically have a big chunk of the common stock to engage in that sort of a slugfest. Far better to uh, be in a situation where you sort of find a way to, to, to resolve things amicably and, uh, and, and sort of move, it, move in separate directions. Hope that helps clear it up a bit. Yeah, no, that definitely helps. And, and Mitch, I think, I think it brings up a great point. I, I always tell um, entrepreneurs that board control is one of the most critical aspects of uh, your decision around funding. And because most people, they don't worry so much about it. They're worried about how much money is an investor putting in and what's the valuation. And uh, meanwhile, you know, there's three board seats going to the preferred investors putting in a million dollars. And that doesn't make any sense. And, and, and sorry, maybe you can you can pick this up as well. Um, Maybe talk about like in these early situations, like maybe it's where it's first money in. What, what sort of what sort of board are we seeing in those cases? Are, are is it is it typically you know a couple of founders with the first investor in, or what, what do you see in those cases? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So most of the investments we make are are again very early stage, close to the founding of a company, or or within months of a business kind of getting up and running. Uh, and, and so usually the board at that time when we invest tends to have the founding CEO. Sometimes uh, it may have, let's say if there's two or three founders, all of them may be on the board or, or two of the three may be on the board. Uh, and, and then usually uh, myself or, or another CRV representative. Got it. And then, and then what we find is as the company goes on to do subsequent financings, you, we can expect other uh, investors to join the board with each of those next rounds, and, and Mitch can speak to this, but generally uh, in each round uh, there tends to be a representative for that new class of shares 
uh, you know, representing, let's say, if we do the A round, I may represent all of the A Series A preferred right. shareholders, uh, even if CRV may not be the only CR Series A uh, preferred investor. Uh, the Series B may have a board member uh, representing the Series B, et cetera. And then as companies progress, or sometimes very early on, uh, we'll find that the, you know some founders or, or some boards decide you know they'd, they'd also love to have an independent uh, board member. That person could serve uh, as a CEO coach. Uh, that person could uh, also just potentially help with you know branding or fundraising or, or other advice. Th th those people can serve a number of different functions. Mitch, what do, what do you think? Uh, yeah, what's I, what's I, the typical uh, structure there? I, I think Sar got it just right, which is you know you're you're by the time you get to an A round, I think you're you're likely to have a situation where you'll have one or two venture investors and probably a parallel number of, of founder investors, and, and likely an independent. And as you progress through later rounds, that may shift a bit so that you have a majority held by the investors. And I, I, I think that, that your advice around the concept of really treating those board seats as critical relationships is right. I like to tell my clients that are thinking about this that those board seats those board seats are things that you should treat as as, as important as gold. They they are absolutely, absolutely relationships. Sar made reference earlier to the idea that sort of a relationship like the kind of relationship you might have with your spouse, where you've got to have a lot of open communications. And I think that that um, the, the the person that you pick from from uh, the investors is a critically important one. And I I, I always advise my clients to to be very clear and specific if there's a partner that you like whose track record that you respect or you find you've got a good relationship with, to really specify that that's the designee you want from that firm and to figure out what happens if he or she goes on to, to do something else. And further, I think of that independent seat is one which can be really valuable to founders uh, who can be you know, a consigliere and a coach, someone who, uh, Sar mentioned a couple of different ways they can help, but that, that idea of being an independent sounding board who has a currency and credibility with, with the venture investors, it's an important position. Uh, very often, those seats go vacant. They are, are I'd say, in the majority of the cases, the around not filled. And I think if there's a possibility to fill them, it is, uh, it's generally to the great benefit of the company to do so if you can find someone that, uh, that everyone around the board table respects. Uh, and I've seen many instances where I think the independent board member has been dispositive on a positive outcome for a company. So I, I take a lot of time on those things. They are the most important part of your term sheet, in my view, isn't price or protective provisions or any of that other stuff. Quite frankly, it's board composition. And the most important factor that will come into play will be the quality of the advice you're getting around the board table. So I think this is a, a really important one. It's one we spend a lot of time working on and making sure people understand it. Great. Well, uh, Mitch, thanks for thanks for joining us, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you again next week. All right, Joe. Look forward to it. Sorry, nice talking with you. Yeah. Take care, thanks, Mitch. Mitch. All right. Well, that's uh, Mitch Zukli from Oric. Some great advice on uh, on CEO situations and and board composition. One of the most critical factors in a startup. Uh, let's see, we're around 5.45 p.m. And, uh, you know, again, if, if you want to give us a call, one eight four 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 founder That's uh, three fours in there. I kind of screwed that up. Uh, or email us at help at founderline.com or tweet to at founderline, and uh, we'll try and answer your questions. So we got about 15 minutes left, Sar. Um, let's see. Uh, I think we have a call from Palo Alto. We have uh, Michael in Palo Alto. Michael, uh, welcome to Founderline. Uh, thanks, guys, for taking my call. Um, my question is more from the employee of a startup point of view, so it might be pretty layman compared to the other questions you've been um, answering here. But um, from for working for a company that's actually doing really, really well, and then the future looks really good as well, but the VC is putting pressure on the company to sell it, and I'm wondering if there, what kind of motivations there might be for that. Is there a disagreement about the future value of the company, or um, do they want the money back to reinvest it, or something like that? Got it. So, the, so the company's doing really well, and the VCs are putting a little bit of pressure to sell the company. And I mean, this could be even more broad, right? This is um, the famous, uh, you know, someone gets offered three billion dollars. 
and then a decision has to get made around do we accept that acquisition offer or not. So um, maybe talk about some of those dynamics. Like what what are those evil VCs thinking when uh, when the, when these sorts of things go on? Sure. Yeah, you know, I'll offer a, a couple comments. Uh, one of which is. Um, actually may, may be less obvious, but, but in some cases we actually see CEOs who use the board as a, as sort of like, you know, the kind of, kind of I, I don't know, an object that helps them, it sort of empowers them, and so they can blame certain decisions on the board or on the venture investors, and it allows them to make hiring, firing decisions, et cetera. And so I guess, you know, the first comment I'd make is that that may actually be totally true, and the CEO may be telling you, the truth and be totally transparent. I would expect that to be the case, but in some cases we have CEOs who some sometimes for whatever reason they'll, you know they'll use the board and the venture guys um, as as the decision makers and sort of put it on us, even though we may not actually be uh, the ones driving that decision. So so I just put that aside. That that's probably not what's happening in in your case. How how does that make you feel when you find out you know that's what they're doing? Like I, I've I've lived through that and I've seen. Yeah. Oh well, the board said we can't we can't do that for you. We can't get you uh, diet yeah. coke in the refrigerator. I mean, you're just like, come on, are you serious? Like, well, so I you know I, I'll tell you, you know the um, it does serve a purpose. Uh, you know the, the the most common place where we see that is actually in employee negotiations, where the CEO says, I see. I'm an, I want to hire Joe as my VP. I'm going to go to bat and ask for this compensation package, and then they go into the room and. And then they come out and they say, you know, the, the board is not going to, is not supportive of this package. You know, we'll, we'll give you 25K less. And right, it's a negotiation right. tactic, you know, right. that, that um, is, is probably more common than I think many employees recognize. Um, and, and there's often truth to what's happening there. And there's often, you know, it's just a tactic. Um, as it relates to, you know, uh, why a venture firm would put pressure on the company to sell, you know, there, there's also a list of, of answers there. Um, you know, many venture capitalists, I think, actually would really trust the CEO and the CEO's view of the market in what, you know, in, in terms of whether it's the right time to sell. We think great CEOs know the market better than anyone. And if they really want to keep going, uh, you know, they, they must know something, they must see something. And, and generally, yeah. the VCs will want to get behind that. That being said, you know, th that's not always the case. Sometimes the, the VCs may not actually have that faith uh, in the in the CEO, or they may have a different view on the market uh, based on other market activity that they're seeing, uh, or um, there can be entirely other sort of ex other factors happening in the background. So another example can be depending on who that investor is. Um, you know, we're we are very very fortunate that you know we're we're investing out of our 15th fund, and we've been able to make a lot of money for our investors over 40 years. There, there's a number of firms who uh, our business is quite difficult, and there's a number of firms who have not been able to deliver great returns to their investors, and they can't raise another fund. And so those firms often, if they want to go fundraise, need to show that they're putting points on the board and that they can generate outcomes. And, and it's often in those cases where we'll see you know, some of our partners who, who may be just be weaker partners in terms of their staying power, they will do mm. strange, irrational things to us, you know, from our point of view and from the entrepreneur's point of view. But what they're really trying to do is, you know, get a sale so that they can go hit the road and, and raise their next fund. And so whether a company is doing great, if they can generate a return, it may not be the best return if they kept kept going with the company. You know, they may be actually just pressuring the sale just so, because of other things happening in the background as it relates to their business. Because just like the entrepreneur has to go raise money from the venture capitalists, yep. you know, we actually uh, have to go raise money from other investors ourselves, and, and we need to show a track record, uh, and, and that track record ultimately is from, from generating returns and exits. Well, and I, and I think that's a great point because um, it's, o it's always critical to know what is somebody's motivation behind whatever it is they're pushing or not pushing or whatever it might be. And having lived through some of those situations where you're, you're pitching an investor and then you later find out that they don't have any money to invest because they haven't closed the new fund or um, they're in the middle of funding a competitor. I actually, I had this happen to me personally, um, a very major VC, uh, you know, 
first meeting, guy said, um, I want to get you a term sheet tonight. Please send me all the documents so we can distribute them throughout the partnership. And then he went dark. And, uh, and, and I was like, what is going on here? I, I called, I emailed, no response. And it turned out like a month later, he, he was funding something that was very similar to what I was doing. And so wow. just, just understanding the motivation, like you said, you know, do they have the money to invest or not? Or um, e- even, you know, same thing with CEOs. Like, why is, why is the CEO telling me this? Is it because he's trying to cover his ass or is he, is he um, you know, does he truly believe that? Uh, you know, what's, what's going on there? I, th- I think those are, those are great points. Um, so uh, we've got, got a couple more emails here. This one is from, uh, from Renee in Silicon Valley. I'll, I'll just read it to you so you have a chance to, uh, to answer back. I have the opportunity to join a startup as employee number nine as a product manager. But I don't know know the founders, and I haven't heard of the out-of-state company they started and sold. They say it was a modest success in an unrelated market. I've been offered 1% apparently equity and a reasonable salary. So um, I I think what she's asking is, uh, you know, how do you evaluate an opportunity like that where maybe the comp looks good, but you're not sure about the people or, uh, you know, there could be some factors that you know, some warning lights are going off in your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Renee, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and uh, I guess without knowing the, the company or the product, uh, you know, I'd be happy to give you my, my opinion on those if I, if I knew it. But, you know, I, I think in some cases you have to use your own judgment, a li- you know, in terms of uh, evaluating has the company, you know, at what stage is the company? Has it found product market fit? Or are you the one that's really going to be responsible for finding finding the product and building the product that's going to work? You know, there's potentially different levels of risk associated with that. If you're on a, you know, if you're with a company that's already figured out what they're doing, then you know, one offer may look much better than taking on a ton of risk, uh, you know, to to try and discover what product is going to work in a particular market. Uh, you know, a lot of folks join startups where they're not funded. You know, they're they're drawing very little salary or they have no equity. You know, I I would offer that you know if you're they're paying you a reasonable uh, salary relative to what you might be making somewhere else, uh, and they're offering you a percent of the company. Uh, you know, that's that that seems generous for uh, being in the first call it 20 employees of of a business, uh, roughly depending on how much runway they they have and how long they could pay you that salary. Um, so those are the things I would probably. Uh, if I were in your shoes, ask yourself, is, is this a market that I believe in? Is this a product that uniquely solves a meaningful problem? Have they figured that part out? Um, have you spent enough time with the founders to at least believe in them that they are the right folks who, who will figure that out? Um, you know, if you have confidence in those areas, then, uh, and, and you've asked the question of how much cash they do have or how long they could pay you for, then you know it, it. It sounds like it could be a, a good offer. Yeah, and I, and I would add to that um, just knowing like who the people are and getting to know them better. And you, you know you're going to be in the trenches with these people. And if you've not worked with them before, you know your work styles styles might clash, and uh, uh, you know you may may not be a good fit. So spending as much time as you can up front, getting to know them, um, I think is a really critical piece of that because. At the end of the day, you know, it's the people you work with, uh, and yes, the product you're working on and those sorts of things. But if you don't like the people you're working with, you're you're gonna you're gonna hate it. So make sure you spend quality time with the founders or anybody else who's on the team to uh, to get to know them better. Um, we're we're running low on time, uh, but but I I have to ask this question, and uh, uh, it it came from somebody, and and this is more of a a generic thing, but. Um, uh, someone who tried to reach you a couple of times via email oh, and, and didn't get a response back. And I, I think people have to know, like, as an investor, you, you get literally, you know, tens to hundreds of emails every day from people who want to pitch you. So um, they want to know, you know, why didn't they hear back yet and what's going on? So maybe, maybe just talk generically about, um, you know, the demands and like how you, how you handle the, the incoming wave of, all the opportunities that come to you to give people a sense of how a, how a VC operates. Sure. 
Yeah, you know, I guess you know. First of all, I, I guess it's frustrating to not know who the who the name is, who the person is. In that, you know, we try and be responsive to uh, most folks that that email us. You know, that being said, in in many cases, we find a lot of great entrepreneurs. You know, will will try and continue a thread of you know, we'll say no or we're not interested, and and you know they'll keep pinging us. And and at a certain point, we just don't have the bandwidth. Uh, to you know, to keep responding and saying no, you know, it's sort of sort of like answering my my young son sometimes. Yes, yes, with um, the repeat questions. Right? That's right. But but beyond that, you know, we, I mean, we definitely try and be responsive and read emails. But but that you are right. We get hundreds, if not you know, thousands of of emails a week uh, from folks that we don't know. Um, and I think there's a lot of data and content out there that says, you know, it, you can sometimes get a meeting with a VC through, you know, people that, you know, just through an inbound email, but um, it generally will be because it's, it's in line with something that we've already stated, you know, in the media or through a blog post that it's an area we're interested in. If I say I'm interested in transportation and I want to see everything related to transportation, right. and you're working on a transportation startup, we're likely going to read and respond to those emails. but. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, unfortunately, we just can't respond to every email from people that we don't know. We, we tend to recommend that if you really want to get to us, uh, you know, a great path is through our networks and find someone who, you know, knows us well, who can vouch for you, who's willing to ping us and make an introduction. You know, I, I, I think we respond quite, quite quickly to all of those um, and really build our network that way. But you know, we work pretty hard. We don't get a lot of sleep. We, we, we spend a lot of time on email, <laughs> you know, just trying to offer some level of, of sort of customer service to entrepreneurs who inbound us, um, you know, but the caveat is we're not all, always able to do that. Great. It's, yeah, it's a tough job. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard if you feel bad, like you're not getting back to people, but it's just a question of prioritization. I, I'd also just add one other comment, which is I think the, the other thing is, um, at least for us uh, at CRV, you know, we spend a lot of time, we don't invest often, and when we do invest, you know, we spend a lot of time with our founders. So I think there's a number of other investors who probably spend 90% of their time just looking for new investments. Uh, you know, we actually love yeah. the company exactly. building side of exactly. things, and so, you know, it's part of our job to find new investments. It's, it's not all of our job. Well, believe it or not, we're out of time. Uh, this has been fantastic. We probably Thanks. could have gone another hour, but um, uh, Sar has been a great guest. Thank you for uh, for joining us. Again, uh, Sar is at CRV. You can reach him on Twitter at at Sar Sar, S-A-A-R, S-A-A-R. Um, next week, we'll have another episode of Founderline. Our guest is going to be Paul Martino from Bullpen Capital, who uh, actually was an investor in my last company, He's a great entrepreneur uh, as well. He, uh, he started um, Aggregate Knowledge and was an investor in Zynga as well as FanDuel. And now he's the founder and uh, uh, general partner of, of Bullpen Capital. So next Thursday, 5 o'clock Pacific time. Um, once again, I want to thank our fantastic sponsors, Auric and Ustream. We really appreciate you guys uh, getting behind us. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. We're at Founderline. If you have questions and we weren't able to get to them, we're, we're sorry, but just email us, help at founderline.com, uh, or check out our website. You can subscribe to get email updates from us, watch previous episodes, and see who the future guests are going to be. Um, thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>